Plus member video and was originally recorded during the Force for Good class series in January 2016 with Sharon Salzberg and friends. Well, why don't we start with a meditation since we're here? And perhaps not everybody is here yet, but um, tonight we're going to talk about loving kindness, of course, and there are so many ways in which we cultivate and develop this, this strength. The word in Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text that we usually translate as meditation, that word is bhavana, B-H-A-V-A-N-A, and it literally means cultivation. So we are cultivating the ground, and, and there's a certain, I think a kind of patience implied there, like when you're growing a garden, you cultivate the ground, but you can't really make it happen faster, just because you're full of craving for like a Brussels sprout or something. Right? You put the conditions in place. I've often told the story, I'm sure many of you have heard me tell it, about my friend Joseph Goldstein, who <coughs> he also tells the story about himself. When he was about nine years old, he grew his first and only garden. And he said he'd get so kind of impatient when he saw the little green fluffy stuff growing on top of the carrots. He'd yank them up to help them grow faster. So he didn't have that much of a harvest, and which perhaps is the reason it was his only garden. Um, he was about nine. So it implies a kind of patience. We're creating the conditions so that we want can emerge. And in this case, what, we, what we're talking about emerging is the force of love or loving kindness. And so there are many, many ways in life, in meditation, we cultivate the strength and within meditation there are lots of methods and approaches and so even just to begin with I'd like us just to sit and settle your attention on the feeling of the breath the actual sensations <coughs> of the in and out breath and in this system it's just the normal natural breath you don't have to try to make it deeper or different find the place where the breath is clearest for you or strongest for you. Maybe that's the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. Thank you. You can find that place, bring your attention there, and just rest. And see if you can feel one breath. What most people discover in this exercise is it's not 7,000 breaths before their minds start to wander. It's usually like one or two. And then we're gone. Our minds jump to the past, they jump to the future, judgment, speculation. And then comes the magic moment when we realize, oh, it's been quite some time since I last felt a breath. That's one of the places in meditation we cultivate loving kindness and compassion. Because there's nothing easier than to realize we've been distracted and just to spin out in a tremendous amount of self-judgment. I'm the only one in the room who's thinking, no one else is thinking, why am I always thinking? They're not thinking, they're sitting here in bliss. They're probably enlightened already, or they're awfully close, right? So when we get lost in that kind of spin out, not only does it extend the time of the distraction, sometimes considerably, but it's so demoralizing. It doesn't help us make progress, actually. So right there, you place your attention on the feeling of the breath, just the normal, natural breath. Who knows where your mind will go? You recognize that, see if you can gently let go. 
and with some kindness toward yourself, begin again. And if you have to do that a few billion times in the next few minutes as we sit together, that's fine.
So a little later tonight, we'll, we'll do some loving kindness meditation, which is its own sort of stream of, of practice, its own methodology. So as you know, no doubt, these Wednesday evenings, 17 of them, I believe, are dedicated to uh, Dan Goldman's book, A Force for Good, uh, which he wrote for the Dalai Lama. It's the Dalai Lama's vision of good in the world, um, taking these values and bringing them into action, values of loving kindness and compassion and uh, a kind of inclusivity, a sense of equality, things like that. And, and uh, what does that look like in a day, you know, in real time? It, in some ways, it's an extension of what seemed to be really moving the Dalai Lama um, many years ago at the um, turn of the millennium when he had a book that came out called Secular Ethics saying that if what the world really needs is good-heartedness more than anything, so that we rest upon a very powerful truth, which is that our lives are intertwined. We are counting on one another. We're interdependent. We have a moral obligation to help take care of one another. So if that's true, what if you don't happen to have any kind of religious belief and your inspiration is not coming from a systematized religion or a dogma or a belief system. Well, that's a lot of people, right? And uh, it doesn't need to be coming from a religious belief. That conviction, that understanding, that commitment can be coming from he would feel science and a really clear-eyed understanding of this is reality. This is how things are. So how are we going to respond to that truth and a commitment to caring that isn't born out of conventional religion and hence secular ethics. Um, and that seems to still be a, a very big ongoing theme. So when we talk about loving kindness, or we talk about qualities like compassion, for some people, of course, uh, the religion of their childhood was the inspiration or a personal conviction within that kind of context. For an awful lot of people, it's not. And so I would say for myself, uh, I went to India when I was 18 to study meditation and all of my practice in the 45 years since then. Um, those of you who've been sitting here with me Tuesday nights know that January is my anniversary month. Uh, and it's been 45 years since I started practicing, shockingly. Uh, how many two-year-olds really meditate, you know? But um, it's always been within the context of a Buddhist tradition, and so that's the kind of languaging or um, approach that I'm most familiar with, but there's nothing about that that is about becoming a Buddhist. As uh, the Buddha himself is so famous for having said, he said, don't believe anything. Don't believe anything because I said it. Don't believe anything because a great elder has said it. Don't believe anything because you've read it in a sacred text. He said, put it into practice. See for yourself what's true. And as I said the other night, when I went to India and I began meditating, it was in the context of an intensive 10-day retreat. And the first night, as San Goenka, who was the, my teacher, my first teacher, said, so this is the first night of my first actual exposure to meditation, he said, the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught a way of life. So from day one, that has been like a, a foundational statement for me and a real pillar of my understanding. So even though I'm going to quote the Buddha, and it's all, well, for me, it's just so easy to use those stories and anecdotes and that imagery, um, it's a very personal thing. And it, it has 
nothing to do with really becoming a Buddhist. It has to do with how one lives one's life and, and sifting through all the messages we get about what makes us strong and where happiness is going to lie and what we're capable of. Sometimes we're taught we're capable of so little and really we're capable of so much. And so um, it's all about one's own experience in the end. So in that context, how do we manifest good in the world? How do we really make a difference in the world? Well, to begin with, we look at our own happiness, which seems ironic because I think we're often taught that that's selfish or self-centered or self-preoccupied, and that's in some ways you would say that's the whole problem. But it's actually not the urge to be happy that's the problem. It's our very limited notions and distorted thinking about where happiness is to be found, the greatest happiness is to be found. You know, if only I had a bigger apartment, I would be happy. If only I had the perfect relationship, which of course would never, ever, ever change, then I would be happy. If only they made a Toyota sedan with four-wheel drive again, then I would be happy. These are you know, my personal wishes. <laughs> if only, whatever. Um, you know, and, and really, if we can combine that urge for happiness with wisdom instead of with ignorance and just what we've been taught and you know, being kind of gullible, just believing the things we've been taught, then it's a very powerful force because then that urge for happiness becomes like a homing instinct for freedom. We can cut through many obstacles. So the Dalai Lama, back when his English was not quite as good as it is now, but I like the old way he used to say it, and he used to say, if you're going to be selfish, be a wise selfish. In other words, if you want to be happy, figure it out. And our own happiness is not something, when it's not just endlessly seeking pleasure or something very superficial, being conflict avoidant, when it's much deeper than that, it's like a resource. That's the place from which we can care about others. We can make efforts to help. That's the place from which we can even pay attention to others. Because really, don't we know that when we feel depleted and exhausted and overcome and broken inside, it's not that easy to have even the wherewithal to try to help somebody to even notice, and if we do notice, we're resenting. You know, like you think you've got problems. <laughs> like, right? So our own happiness, if you redefine it, is really the basis for a sense of inner resource. Another way it's sometimes described um, in the Buddhist teaching, when they talk about material generosity, it's also symbolic for generosity of the spirit, the way we are with somebody who's taking care of us, or uh, whether we thank somebody, or we pay attention to somebody uh, when they're talking to us, right? But we often use material generosity as an example because it's concrete, and it just helps in, to um, illuminate all these issues because of that. So. We might give somebody something, you know, sh offer them a meal or give them an object for a whole lot of different reasons. Maybe we offer somebody something because we really want them to have it. Maybe we offer them something and it's more like a medium of exchange. Well, I see you have that really cool thing and 
like I like that pen, for example. And if you, no, no, no. <laughs> but uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, so if if I give you this whatever, maybe you'll give me the pen, or maybe I don't feel I deserve to have anything. And I just give, but it's almost a kind of martyrdom. It's not really generosity. Or maybe there's a video camera on me, or it feels like I'm obliged to somehow offer when I don't really want to. And it's said that the best kind of generosity comes from a sense of inner abundance. That's where it's actually born. And I think we can kind of see that. Like I remember being in Burma as an example um, in the 80s, different times, doing intensive practice. And the financial situation in those retreat centers and monasteries <coughs> is such that um, you're not charged even for room and board because everything you need, every morsel of food you will have is offered to you. In Burma, they don't believe uh, in celebrating your birthday, for example, by, you don't celebrate your birthday by getting gifts, you celebrate by giving gifts. So maybe it's your birthday and you go off to the monastery and you feed as many people, as, you know, you offer the money, you don't cook the food, but you, you end up feeding as many people as you could possibly afford to feed or your daughter's graduating from high school. So you, you go to the monastery, and you, that's how you celebrate that occasion or somebody in your family's died. That's how you honor them. You go to the monastery and you offer food. Once uh, when I was there, and meals are, are a very um, ceremonial occasion, like you come in, it's like a processional and you bow to the Buddha image and you, you, know, you sit down at these family style tables on the floor, just you know, a few people around each table. And I came in and uh, bowed and sat down and looked at the food. And I thought it was hallucinating because it was like an entire Jewish meal. <laughs> I thought, that looks just like white fish salad. <laughs> and that's like chicken soup. <laughs> it turned out that there's a minuscule Jewish community in Rangoon, and somebody had died. So not only did the family come with the offering, the money for the offering, they came with the recipes. So sure enough, it was like an entire Jewish meal. Um, you know, so we never paid anything in Burma, certainly at that time, when it was really an incredibly poor country. It was one of the poorest countries in the world. And it was amazing, because whenever people could come, they'd come and watch you eat. And sometimes it would be a person, a family. Sometimes a whole village would come together for the chance to feed people. They were so honored that you were meditating and so happy for the chance to give. And so here were people who, by any external measure, had very, very little. And then sometimes to leave there and come back and to know people who sometimes had an enormous amount by an external measure, but not that internal feeling of ever having enough. And it's so hard for them to give, right? So that generosity is best born from a sense of inner abundance. And if you don't feel you have enough, you are not enough, it's just not that easy. That's what happiness is. And in the realm of like generosity of the spirit, we offer loving kindness. We really pay attention differently. We act differently. And that same kind of measure of being impoverished comes through, and we need to challenge that what I'm doing could never make a difference. It could never be enough. It's so meager. Um, it's so small. What do they need me for? My good wishes and all of that. But it's really just the same thing. So our own happiness is like resource within. It's that sense of sufficiency or abundance that allows us to really care. And so we pay attention to that. It's not selfish. It really, you know, these days, of course, the getting on a plane tomorrow. So, uh, you know, the 
cliche really is the safety announcements on an airplane where the flight attendant says, um, if the cabin pressure drops and the oxygen masks descend, put your own on first before you try to help anybody else. So it is the perfect example. And at one point I was talking to a friend of mine who's a writer, and I said, I can't bear to use that example. Every colleague I have uses that example. Every colleague I have who writes, writes that example. I just, I can't do it. And then she told me, the woman I was talking to said, you know, I was just on an airplane and they made that announcement and the woman in the seat next to me said, I could never do that. I could never put my own mask on first. And I thought, maybe I can use that. <laughs> this is still like relevant and provocative and challenging. Look at that. So I just used it. <laughs> right? So it's in that spirit, not that we're going to only focus on feeling good, but because this is the resource out of which we can sustain an effort. Because anybody who tries to make a difference in anyone's life, a person, society knows there is not easy and it's usually not immediate and nothing in life seems to be a straight shot which is why when I teach meditation I emphasize so much that moment of beginning again because I really believe there is nothing where we just make a decision go for it it's done right we go forward, we fall down, we have to pick ourselves up or let others help us up, we go forward again. We have a giant aspiration and we lose touch with it. We have to start over. We have really deep values, we kind of forget them. We have to remember and begin again. So that moment, that movement of the heart is really, it's very important being able to start over and start over and start over. And it's not easy to care and not drown in that caring, to have compassion for yourself as well as for someone else. To have compassion for someone and realize, I'm not giving in, that would just be wrong. Or to have compassion for someone and realize, I can't fix it. It's not up to me sadly enough, but that's so. So the deeply embodied knowledge of that kind of wisdom is not easy, but it's actually what allows us to go on and not just freak out because we feel like we failed or we're frustrated or it's taking too long or whatever it might be. We're not in control, oh no, I'm leaving. Um, you know, that's, that's what we really need to be cultivating. So the metta sutta, metta is the word in Pali, maitri is the word in Sanskrit um, for loving kindness. Uh, as I often say, the word, the phrase loving kindness is a little bit awkward, um, simply because I don't, really think, unless you're in a very special place, you will necessarily hear it quoted. You know, if you're, at, you're in some diner and you're listening to the conversation going on at the next table, um, you will, it would be so unlikely that you hear the term loving kindness. <laughs> Once I was literally in a diner, that's why I said that, on the Upper West Side. and. Uh, and I heard this conversation at the next table, and uh, this, this man said, or this woman said, what's a jubu? And I practically leaped over into their laps, you know, because the term is used for like a Jewish Buddhist. And then he said, you know, it's a Jewish Buddhist. And she said, what's that? And I was like, and then they noticed me, and they said, somebody said, would you like to join us? <laughs> And I said, no, no, <laughs> sorry to, you know. 
be nosy, it's just I am one, you know? So I thought it was kind of an interesting conversation. But most likely you do not overhear a conversation on loving kindness. And so my concern is that that might make the state itself seem somewhat arcane or removed from day-to-day -day life or precious in the negative sense of the word. Um, the literal translation of metta, thank you so much for doing this. The literal translation of metta, it's M-E-T-T-A, is friendship. So it means developing the art of friendship toward oneself, and that means all aspects of oneself. And you still need some. Uh, toward others. Some people still need a copy of the sutta. Yeah. Uh, the literal meaning of, literal translation of the word metta, which is spelled M-E-T-T-A, is friendship. So that means, first of all, friendship toward ourselves. And it means all aspects of ourselves, those parts of ourselves we like a lot and we celebrate, and those parts of ourselves we don't like that much, and those parts of ourselves we're a little bit disconnected from. And ultimately, friendship toward all that lives, toward all of life. Now, friendship doesn't mean giving in. It doesn't mean succumbing. Um, metta is a powerful, motivating force. I even hesitate to use friendship uh, because I'm afraid it sounds a little too gooey and acquiescent. I tend to use connection because that's what it really is, I think. It's this powerful acknowledgement our lives have something to do with one another, that our lives are interconnected. It doesn't mean you like somebody. It doesn't mean you're going to take them home. It doesn't mean you're going to say yes when they ask you something. It doesn't mean you're going to give them any money. But there's a sense of inclusion, inclusion rather than exclusion in your heart, right? Everybody wants to be happy. This being also wants to be happy. Everybody is vulnerable to change and to loss. This being, too, is vulnerable. May they be happy. May they see their way through. You know, may they get free of what's holding them back, or maybe their tiny little distorted notion of where happiness is to be found. Sort of reminds me of, you know how sometimes you meet somebody who says they're really lonely, and then you hear the way they talk to other people, and you think, well, no wonder, <laughs> you know? It's like, and the loneliness is genuine. The urge to connect is genuine, but we don't have a clue so much of the time. And we're so conditioned. We have so many habits. We're taught so many things. It takes a lot to step back from all that and say, I'm going to figure it out. I'm not going to just go with you know, what I've been taught or what's conventional or what seems easy or what's familiar. I'm going to look for a deeper sense of happiness. Right? So some people um, would say that a better translation for metta even then loving kindness is love. Bob would say that, Bob Thurman. Um, that I think is also very complicated because of the many, many different ways we use the word love. Um, sometimes it really is that medium of exchange. I will love you as long as you love me in return. Does anybody else need a um, sutta? Here, you guys have a look. Thank you. Um, I will love you as long as you say so in return in this precise way. I will love you as long as the following 15 conditions are met. And I once, I used that example in a room and someone didn't like it. And they said, only 15. 
So I said, oh, okay, I would love you as long as, however many. I would love myself as long as I never make a mistake. So how long is that gonna last, right? That's such a fragile, breakable state. It's not really what we mean by metta. So it's, it's a certain meaning of love, but it's not that. Um, that can be so fleeting and leave us sort of bereft. Oh, I made a mistake, I'm no good, right? So I do tend to use connection, or my old wish was that metta itself would enter the culture as a term, because of course some, some words do. And it was like ages ago, and the New York Times had an interview with the writer Alice Walker, and she talked about her meditation practice, and she said she did metta. So I thought, okay, this is it. You know, the New York Times used it. So. Clearly, everyone's going to just start using the word meta. So, of course, no one started using the word meta uh, because of that. Um, and then I forget how many years ago when um, the then L.A. Laker, Ron Artest, changed his name to Meta World Peace. And I got so excited. Um, and there was, you know, the announcement, there was this brief flurry of media interest and people, you know, some journalist wrote to me and said, uh, have you been a big influence on his life? And I said, I don't know who he is. You know. <laughs> and what is Meta? And then maybe six months later, the paperwork went through, so then there was another brief flurry of interest. And, and then uh, poor Meta behaved badly in some way. Um, and then my friends were sending me so many headlines, which were all real, you know, from papers like Meta lets us down, <laughs> Meta fails us, you know, poor guy. Um, so that didn't work. So I don't know that Meta will ever, occasionally I meet people and they just use it, so I think that's nice, but uh, think about connection because one other mistake we make is that we define loving kindness as a certain narrow band of feeling. It's a certain, in our minds, it's a certain emotional reaction. It may not be emotional at all. You might just look at somebody and find yourself in them or recognize they're really struggling, but you're not having some huge emotional response or it's a sense of inclusion rather than discounting. Um, those moments when you think you know all about somebody just based on assumption, and then something happens to threaten that superstructure of assumption, and you feel like, oh, now I really see them you know, much more truthfully. Um, I used to, I still teach in Washington, D.C. fairly often, and um, I used, when I was teaching a day long, which meant weekends, uh, day, the facility they used to rent, and it's since been torn down, but it was an elementary school. And that was really my favorite facility because the school had its own rules of kindness, which were these huge sheets of paper along the corridors. So whenever we took a break or we did walking meditation, we would all just like stand there and read the rules of kindness. And it said things like, um, don't hurt anyone on the inside or on the outside. And my very, very favorite rule of kindness was everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to play. Not everybody's going to be my best friend. <clears throat> Not everyone's going to come home with me. But everybody gets to play. Everybody counts. Everybody matters. That's just fundamental. And that may not be hugely emotional. It may be, of course, but it may not be. And so I think that's a mistake to sort of consign the sensibility of loving kindness to a certain emotion. Because if you are doing loving kindness as a meditation practice, I've seen this over and over again for many years. 
you may not be sitting awash in a great wealth of emotion, but something's shifting inside of you. And the place it will reveal itself is in your life, which is, of course, where it counts. If you make a mistake, if things go awry, if you're meeting a stranger, um, if you've held all these ideas about someone and then you have the chance to really listen, that's where it'll show. And you, you realize, wow, I'm different. Even though I can't say like Thursday at three o'clock, you know, I had the great breakthrough experience and it all opened up. Okay, so another great myth around loving kindness is that it will weaken us. It'll have us be too passive and kind of gooey and that it's sentimental and it's overwrought and it's um, whatever your image is of, of some hippie thing. Um, I have a friend who, so my first book was called Loving Kindness and he said that he was so embarrassed. He used to read it on the subway and he was so embarrassed to be seen reading a book called Loving Kindness that he found a way to cover it, you know, so no one could see what he was reading. And I understand that, but I thought, at the time I thought, wow, it's like pornography or something, you know, like, what are we embarrassed about? Shouldn't we be embarrassed about reading like hatred, you know, or, uh, but we do, I think, I think it's a big current conditioning we think of something like love or loving kindness as, as just being kind of gooey and uh, making us lose discernment and lose energy and lose power, which of course is completely untrue. It's a force. And if you are inspired by anybody, you know, and you read their story, um, it's something like that which gets people up in the morning even if they're very ordinary looking lives and they're doing great, great things for someone. And it's, it's based on that sense of connection. Another great myth, and this figures into you know, my world a lot, is the idea that these qualities like love or loving kindness cannot be trained. And I understand that idea actually, because the idea that they can be trained is really sort of, it comes off as sounding sort of bizarre. Like, well, I did a three-day program at Tibet House and I, I left loving, you know, or I got my certificate in loving kindness, or I did seven days at the Insight Meditation Society and now I love everybody because I learned how. And uh, obviously it's not like that. You know, that does sound really strange and mechanistic and forced and hypocritical, but it's not like that. We believe that just like cultivating the ground, right, creating the conditions for something else to arise, if we learn how to use our attention differently, we will have created the conditions for qualities like love and compassion to arise. Not because we're forcing them, not because we're like Joseph pulling up those carrots, but because we have worked to create the conditions. And the conditions really have a lot to do with attention. You know, what does it mean to walk into a store and look at that clerk instead of through them? What does it mean to look at yourself not just as the idiot who said that stupid thing, but even acknowledging that in a bigger way. Acknowledging your goodness, your potential for change, your yearning to be happy in a, a beautiful sense. What does it mean to listen to one another, to find ourselves in one another, to let go of all of those assumptions that we might hold about a person or a type of person or whatever it might be. What does it mean? That's what the practice actually is. So we change the way we pay attention. And I think one of the Dalai Lama's main points um, in the teachings that come through in the book 
is that th that is a prelude to action. It's not like you go home and you think, wow, I feel good. I'm filled with loving kindness. Um, but this becomes the motivating force that takes flight into action. Whether it's really immediate, like person-to-person -person action, um, thanking somebody, or not just obsessing about your email when you're seemingly talking to them, <coughs> or recognizing that we are counting on one another. One of the things, um, sometimes if I go into a company or um, a organization or business, one of the reflections I sometimes suggest is, well, how about if you just reflect on how many other people need to be doing their job well for me to be able to do my job well? Because we're counting on one another. We really are. That we work in systems, you know? It's like a network. Like right this moment, somebody's fixing one my computer, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my desktop, which has all my most recent writing on it, decided to stop receiving or sending email, which means that it's a desktop, right? Which means I have to like pick it up, and deliver it to a publisher. Um, because it's not relinquishing what it's got on there, right? So I'm counting on her like, to help. We all are in that position all of the time. I have a friend, speaking of basketball, who um, some of you may have read his book or seen us. We've done some things together in New York. Um, He's probably done some things alone. His name is George Mumford. His book is called The Mindful Athlete. He's the meditation coach for the New York Knicks, which apparently last year saying that was really bad. You know, I felt like I had to protect him. And I'd say, he's just the meditation coach. He's not the coach, you know. Um, this year I gather is a little better. Is that true? Not so much. <laughs> OK. But before then, he was, he was um, with the LA Lakers. And before that, he was with the Chicago Bulls. So uh, you know, Phil Jackson just kind of brings him wherever he goes. And so um, he's an old, old friend of mine and long-term practitioner. So when his book was first coming out, we started doing some things together in New York. And um, uh, one thing I asked him, which I thought was really interesting, um, I said, do you use the word mindfulness now when you're teaching? And he said, yeah, now I can, because it's so much more palatable a word. And I said, do you use the word compassion? And he said, no, that's too much. <laughs> so I, but I knew he must be talking about the quality, so I said, what do you say? So he thought for a moment, and then he said, I say, don't be hating. Don't be hating on yourself. Don't be hating on others. And that works. And uh, what came through in, in all these evenings was sort of this um, real, I guess, foundation of Phil Jackson's philosophy, which is that you've got to function as a team. And so I've heard many times people would ask George, well, how do you get like a brilliant superstar? who's like totally devoted to personal excellence, how do you get them to also really consider they are part of a team? And George says, because that's how you win. That's how you actually win. So it's not like gooey, right? That's reality. And so that's the kind of stretch of loving kindness. What does it mean to acknowledge that interdependence? What does it mean? to have a sense not so um, rigid of like self and other and us and them, but to have more of a sense of like we together, this kind of team. Um, that's what the 
<coughs> manifestation of loving kindness is based on and how it will come forth. Um, it's very different in different ways. You know, people uh, have different skills, they have different passions, they have different talents. Um, different things irritate different people. They're just, you know, you can't let it ride. You just feel like you need to take action. And uh, there's lots of different ways, but there is some way because it's not just about feeling a certain way. Once we have deepened this wealth of inner resource and this shift in what's motivating us, so it's more a sense of connection rather than fear or wanting to impress people or anything like that, then all of our actions have that flavor of being different. So why don't we take a look at the actual words of the Buddha on loving kindness. As many of you know, when you look at actual teachings from the Buddha, not commentaries, but actual transmissions from the Buddha, it isn't often, if ever, that there's very specific meditation instruction. Those appear more in the commentaries. You know, so when I teach metta, as we're going to do later tonight, we're going to do practice that involves repetition of phrases, it involves concentration, it involves imagery, and you don't find any of that here. What you find here is the, the universe of, of loving kindness. It's the context. It's the spirit with which it's all done. And interestingly enough, it's not just internal, of course. It's how we live. It's how we speak. It's how we respond to one another. And I'm going to read it, and you might, out loud, and you might think, uh, just notice if certain lines really resonate with you as appropriate, challenging, whatever it, it might be, okay? And then there's some parts, of course, that I'll, I'll explain afterwards. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short, or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection this is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. So 
So first, I'll just say, be at ease, may all beings be at ease, really has a sense of peace. May they know peace, right? May, may there be peace. And peace is not like sleepy peace, right? It's full-hearted presence without the sort of twists and turns of the ways we normally were overreacting all of the time, right? So it's kind of an abiding peace. And of course, these days we would say as a parent protects with their life rather than have it just be a mother. And then there is that mysterious line at the end, being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. So you can take that symbolically as this world of suffering and strife and craving and um, <coughs> the kind of creation of the world, that endless merry-go-round as we, as we know it, the world of samsara, of, of um, being bound in, in these ways. So was there perhaps a line that, or two that struck you as interesting? And here, I always like free from drowsiness. <laughs> Do you have the microphone? Right. Do you? Anybody? She's going to give you the microphone, OK? That'll just help us. Thank you. Um, I do like this, the so with a boundless heart. So with a boundless heart. Straightforward and gentle in speech, how you get yes. that balance. Uh-huh. And over here? Over here. Yeah. You have to hold your microphone close to your mouth. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't sure. I mean, I sort of think I understand, but now I can't find it. If you hold it really closely. I haven't that's said great. anything yet. Great. Oh, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later re reprove. I, I wasn't, I felt a little unsure. I felt a little unsure of that. I liked all the good stuff. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Um, you know, it's a very traditional perspective on conscience. It's, it's sort of like, you know, would you say that in front of the Buddha? Maybe not. Um, and you know, it is coming from a very traditional culture where this is uh, conscience is um, not, it's our internal monitor of realizing, ooh, like I'm about to tell a lie to somebody and I remember what it felt like when someone lied to me and that felt so bad. And so the example is of a, a feather going near a flame, just curling back on itself. It's like you just don't want to go there. But conscience is also part of that collective understanding, right? That we have elders or we have those we respect and we have models for behavior, and that's something one is, you know, meant to be grateful for. Um, we have teachers. It's a very different sort of. I mean, Joseph, my friend Joseph, was um, before he went to India to really more fully get into meditation practice. He was in the Peace Corps in Thailand. That's where he first got exposed to meditation practice. And he just talked about the culture where he was a teacher. He was a teacher in a school teaching English. And the teacher was regarded with so much respect. You know, like he would walk into the classroom and the kids would bow um, compared to, you know, P.S. anything, you know. It's different. It's different. You know, but that's very much that sensibility. Like, thank goodness we have, you know, for those times when 
we're so like overcome with wanting something or uh, not being truthful or something like that that it, it's not um, it's considered a really good thing that we're not only dependent on our internal monitor you know that we have that sense of like I don't think so yeah Yeah, it's like it does guide us toward holding to our aspirations, which is a comment. Someone else have the microphone, or are you just sitting down again? Behind you. Uh, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Something quite astonishing about that. To consider those unborn, not yet born. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot in this. I mean, when we do the practice, you know, there's a lot that's very direct. We call to mind a benefactor, someone who's helped us. We call to mind, um, I think, a very interesting part of the practice is a neutral person that is like that shopkeeper. It's someone we don't strongly like or dislike. And we offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. I'll talk more about that in a minute. We also call to mind, we begin to break down barriers, those near and far away. Um, those beings being born, those in existence, those dying. Um, I have a friend who has very bad insomnia. And she told me that she'll lie in bed at night and rather than fretting and freaking out, she'll do loving kindness practice. And the way she'll do it is she'll start with all beings who are awake. <laughs> Not metaphorically, but literally. So that includes her. But it also includes like water buffalo in India, you know, people going to work at the other end of the world. So all beings who are awake. And then she'll do loving kindness for all beings who are asleep which does not include her, but presumably includes her neighbors, right? So there are lots of ways in which we're like stretching and we're using kind of active imagination to be more and more inclusive in those ways. Is someone behind me? May I ask a good question about something you said earlier? Sure. Um, um, could you say something about the difference between healthy desires and materialistic desires? For instance, you spoke of not wanting that, I'm not sure if it was a Toyota, you know, want, you have to have that car. I do want it. The difference, <laughs> what, no, okay. Um, and the difference between that and, say, wanting to design a car that's safer, you really have a drive to design something that will improve society, that's a healthier desire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a, to distinguish between those. Two. OK, so um, in Pali, again, or in Sanskrit, um, there are actually two different words, both of which tend to be translated as desire. Um, but they mean very different things. One is desire in the sense of craving grasping. Uh, I mean, I do want that car. I used to have one. You know, I had a really old Toyota sedan that had four-wheel drive. Then they stopped making them. But well, I live in Massachusetts, you know, when I'm not here. And, and I have like a really icy long drive. I need a four-wheel drive car. So I, at the moment, I need a four-wheel drive car because my, my current car is really old. Um, so I have been longing, and they don't make that Toyota anymore, but that's what I really want, mm -hmm. right? But there's, there's a certain kind of reality that needs to intrude, since they don't make it anymore, <laughs> right? Um, I used the example the other day of, of uh, once I was teaching here, and I did this kind of out loud meditation on grasping or craving. And uh, that was, I was sitting up here teaching. And I could see, um, it was, of course, a different exhibit. And I could see this Tibetan wall hanging, this tanka, 
just kind of over there. And so this was my out loud meditation. I said, I want that. I have to have that. Of course, I couldn't see the price tag. But it was like, I have to have that. OK, I'm going to buy it. And then at that time, I had a, a different sublet apartment, which was really teensy. And I wasn't allowed to put anything up on the walls. So I remembered that, and I thought, I'm getting a bigger apartment. <laughs> and I'll get a one-bedroom apartment, and that way I'll have a room, and the wall hanging will have its own room. And I can get special lighting, and I can really feature it. And, and then I realized, well, you know, to pay even more rent in New York City, I'm going to have to travel even more so I can teach and, and get the money. So I will virtually never be in New York. And I'll never see my wall hanging, but I'll own it, right? So that was an out loud meditation on greed. It's not that, you know, it's not that we shouldn't want anything or ever buy anything or you know, enjoy the things we have. It's not that. But sometimes we get so consumed by the wanting we don't notice, what am I sacrificing in order to have that thing? Or what am I compromising? Or who am I hurting? Or is it really worth it? That I'm never going to see it, you know, but I'll have it. So we get lost in that world of craving. There's another word, um, which we also translate as desire, which is not about craving. It's about intention, having a strong intention. And intention is a neutral factor um, in the Buddhist psychology, because intention will take on the moral tone of what it arises with. Right? So you can have powerful intention to make a new car, but what's coming up with it? You know, is it greed? Is it love for humanity? Is it uh, just sort of like massive curiosity? Is it devotion to excellence, like to doing your craft well? Those are different, you know? And so strong intentionality can be a great thing. It's not necessarily a negative thing at all. And, but we, you know, we hear like desire, and we think, well, that's better to just stay in bed, you know, and like not do anything. Or if that's what the teachings say, I don't want anything to do with them. And it's not like that, you know? We might have strong strong intentionality, you could call it healthy desire, um, that has nothing to do with uh, the pain that comes from grasping and never being satisfied and, you know, hating every car that I consider because it's not my old Toyota, which is no more. Um, so, you know, they're very different states, actually. Can you, can you back to her? There still seems to be a fine difference between the wall hanging that you may never see and, and the car, which is really useful. It, it almost seems to fall in the category of meta, you know, of making yeah. yourself happy yeah. and, and safe and Which, the wall hanging or the car? The car. Yeah, I mean, I think there's more than a fine difference. I think there's a big difference. You know, but we, we use the same word for both states. And so that is part of the confusion. I think it takes some self-awareness to see the difference, because they're really very different. Are you talking about motivation? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about motivation. Yeah. I was having a conversation with a friend the other day about uh, creating a strong direction in your life. And uh, I said that it's, it's kind of the opposite of a clusterfuck. It's you you have a cluster of things so that, so that it can pull you. So you try to put a lot of elements in one kind of a cloud of ideas that pulls you. And then I said, and then you're allowed to put a naughty thing in there too to make it more attractive. 
you know, so that there's like one element of your personality that, that maybe is a, you're not really supposed to do for spiritual reasons, but because it pulls you so strongly towards the other stuff, and we got stuck on discussing whether that was okay or not. I guess it depends on what you mean by naughty. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not a question of okay or not, you know, like what serves you. Like I have a friend who's like a very rebellious sort, and she takes a lot of pride in not, in marching to a different drummer, you know, and being her own person and not just listening and being a rebel. And I, um, I teach a, a, an intensive loving kindness course every year for seven days at my own center. And she sat it one year, and she came out of it, and she said, now I get it. If you really want to be a rebel, be kind. You know, be ethical. Like, that's different. You know, and I, I think she was right, that um, in a world where, I don't know if I can bear it for all you people who were here last night, tell the story again. Uh, should I do it? For a world where we are taught um, it's a dog-eat-dog dog world. Uh, the story I tell was about, I, I was teaching somewhere, a different retreat, so some days, you know, over the course of some days, and, and I said, I just find that such an odd thing to live by. It's a dog-eat-dog dog world, because first of all, dogs don't eat dogs. But, you know, what a... What a vibe, you know? Um, I will only be happy if I can defeat others and put others down. And, and so this woman at the retreat uh, took the microphone, and she was really shocked. And she was a young woman, but she, still she said, my whole life I thought the saying was, it's a doggy dog world, D-O-G-G-Y, D-O-G. So I basically like ruined her life, you know? <laughs> by saying, no, it's a dog-eat-dog dog world. So the days went on, and then we were at the end of the retreat, and she took the microphone, and she said, I've decided I want to live in a dog-eat-dog dog world. I don't want to live in a dog-eat-dog dog world. You know, that's being a rebel. It was like, I'm not going to live by the common ethic, you know, of denounce everybody and feel better. Uh, it's just not true. You feel worse, you know? So we use our understanding. But that doesn't mean being self-righteous or sanctimonious or kind of holier than thou. You know, it's fun, actually, uh, when, when it's not that sort of self-image to, to be a little... We never think of it. We think of being adventurous as being reckless. But we never think of, of adventurous as getting simpler or more truthful or not being so hung up, or not having, I mean, I just had my second, even though I live in Massachusetts, I have had sublet apartments here for some years, so I've just had my second move in two years. Um, and the two years ago move, I gave away nine boxes of books, mm -hmm. and I thought, I'm not doing that again. You know, because I hadn't read most of them, you know, so I just thought, I'm not doing it again. I'm not accumulating, you know, all those books. I can also use my Kindle. Um, you know, so we think, wow, you know, I don't have to do that. And that's a great moment, whatever it's, it's about. Like, I don't have to do that. Look at that. I can make this other choice. So I think it does depend on what you mean by naughty. Um, Hi. Okay, um, I have a, two questions. One is, uh, like, can you share more about meditation? Because you have so many years' experience of it. Like, uh, recently I found um, it changing all the time. Like, my, I go into meditation and go into half kind of sleep, and, uh, like, a, if some dreams, or I don't know if it's a reality or dream. Mm -hmm. And I feel very strange about mm -hmm. this new experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe you know what stage is that. Mm -hmm. Second question is, um, 
I'm going to be, next month, I'm going to be first time going to India. And I want to hear a little bit more about your sharing about Indian about India? experience. Uh, I'm going to Bodhigaya for 10 days with group of people. But after that, I'm going to plan to stay 20 days. But maybe you can give me a suggestion in person, like where I should go. <laughs> what are you doing in Bodhigaya for 10 days? There is a peace, some sort of peace conference, pray or something. It's mm -hmm. the first time going with okay. Kamapa channel, you know. Mm -hmm. Kamapa, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, maybe after that, some meditation center? <coughs> yeah, yeah, because we're going to do some loving kindness practice together. So, um, uh, Bodh Gaya, India is the town that's grown up around the descendant of the tree they say the Buddha was sitting under when he became enlightened. So, it's an extraordinary place. Um, of course, I have not been there in a very long time, but the things that are extraordinary about it are timeless. Are they from the, you know, the, there's a tree and there's a stupa temple built just near the tree. And um, as my friend Joseph said, it is such a beautiful structure, that temple. He said it's like commensurate with what happened there, like the Buddha's enlightenment. It is, it, it's really beautiful, and I found it a very amazing place. This was a long time ago. Um, and you could actually go and sit all night under the tree, like the Bodhisattva did, not with the same results, sadly. <laughs> but you could do that. And uh, it was part of, I think, my whole orientation toward the humanity of the Buddha, because it's all right there. Um, oh, that's the place they say he was sitting when he became enlightened. That's the place where he did walking meditation for seven days after his enlightenment. Oh, that's the place. As you know, the legend of the Buddha's life before he became the Buddha, uh, when he was known as a bodhisattva being who was seeking enlightenment, um, he lived for 29 years in the palace uh, with... Uh, tremendous indulgence all of the time. And then after, at the age of 29, he left the palace grounds. You know, this is all like the legend. He left the palace grounds, and he saw an older person and a sick person and a corpse and a mendicant, someone who had renounced the worldly life, seeking spiritual truth. And that was his wake-up call. They're called the four heavenly messengers. And so he left the palace. He spent the next six years in extreme self-mortification. A lot of the philosophical schools of India at the time um, held that if you could punish or brutalize your body enough, your spirit would soar free and you would become enlightened. And so he spent six years uh, basically starving and you know, mortifying his body. And, um, and then he came to the conclusion that wasn't the way either. So I think it's interesting as legend, like the power of myth, because it always means something about our own lives. Like, what does it mean now to move from what the culture tells us, which is that extreme indulgence is the way. I don't need just one Toyota with four-wheel drive. I need like five of them, you know? And and then the kind of ways we punish ourselves, if not physically, certainly psychologically, as thinking, oh, if I can put myself down enough, that's a source of, of freedom and liberation. So the Buddha went through those two poles and then came out and said, that's not the way either. And so he ate. He ate a meal. And that's what I was getting to. It's like you're in Bodh Gaya, and someone will say, oh, that's where he ate the meal. Somebody offered him. Uh, milk rice. If you ever go to an Indian restaurant, it's kheer. I always recommend getting the kheer as for dessert, just in case. It's like rice pudding. That's <laughs> the last thing the Buddha ate, Bodhisattva ate before he became enlightened. Um, you know, so it was something to be there and say, oh, that's where he sat and that's where he ate and that's where he, you know, he walked. And uh, it's an extremely powerful, wonderful place. And, and so, too, there's like a circuit and you can decide, you know, where you where you go, there's um, uh, Rajgir, where the Buddha delivered the fire sermon. You know, the eye is burning, the ear is burning. There's Nalanda, the ruins of Nalanda, which was this huge, wonderful uh, 
university, monastic university, you know, of all the traditions coming together. And um, there's Lambini, where he was born. Uh, where I went to Lambini, there was literally nothing there. And now I think there's all kinds of stuff. Um, there's Kushinagar, where he died, you know, so it's a very holy kind of um, pilgrimage route. And, and so it's that kind of thing that I think is, is really wonderful. Um, meditation is a, it's a delicate art. And um, you're not going to have the wrong experience. You, you know, you shouldn't think like I'm doing it wrong. Um, many times people have certain ideas about what should happen. And those are usually kind of off base. And so people often say to me, like if I'm meeting them <coughs> for the first time, and somebody says, I'm a meditation teacher, they'll say, oh, I tried that once. I failed at it. And then they usually describe what they thought should be happening. I failed at it because I couldn't make my mind blank. I couldn't stop my thinking. I couldn't have only beautiful thoughts. I couldn't. Um, keep sleepiness at bay. I couldn't keep the anxiety from coming up. And we always say, hey, you cannot fail at it. That's not possible. Because meditation, good meditation, is not about what's happening. It's about how we're relating to what's happening. How much presence, how much balance, how much kindness are we bringing to bear on? this experience. So that's the point, you know. You don't have to judge your experience or feel that it's wrong or you're doing it wrong, but learning how to relate to it with as much spaciousness and kindness as possible. All that being said, there are also ways in which um, there's such an underlying theme of balance in meditation and there are ways in which we sometimes have to just adjust the balance. One of the very classical ways we talk about balance is by saying that in meditation practice, we're deepening calm, <clears throat> quiet, relaxation, ease, peace. And we are also strengthening energy, alertness. Um, investigation, clarity, right? And those two don't always happen in perfect balance. So my first instinct in hearing your experience is that it sounds a lot like what happens when the calm, quiet, peaceful side of things is really happening, but there's not enough just energy or clarity in one system to match it. And so the first place we go is this state, which is uh, classically known as sinking mind. I call it the ooze. You're just kind of oozing along. And it's very peaceful. And there could be all that imagery. And, but it's just not very sharp. So it's not bad, but it's out of balance. Um, in many practices, like with the breath, if you're using awareness of the breath, I've discovered, you know, I can be <laughs> in that state for a long time before I notice it. That's one of the reasons why this suggestion is there. Um, if you're using something like the breath to have um, a mental note along with the breath to actually be repeating in out, not just feeling the sensations of the breath because it'll just inject some more energy. Like I was once at my retreat center, the Insight Meditation Society. I was once, um, the way our retreats go, there's a sitting in the morning after breakfast where there's some instruction and then question and answer. So it was my turn and I just got up there and I closed my eyes. And as soon as I did, I just slipped off into that state and maybe 20 minutes later, I had the thought, oh, I should you know, maybe do some mental noting. 
as well as feel the breath. And so I started mentally repeating in out. And when I did that, it's like the clouds cleared. And I realized I'd been sitting in front of like 100 people for 20 minutes, and they'd been waiting for some instruction. <laughs> and I had just been kind of like spaced out. And um, so I didn't say anything. And then we sat for the rest of the period, and I rang the bell, and then I described what had happened. You know, other techniques sometimes, like loving kindness, for example, um, which we're going to end the evening with, they're much more active, they're more verbal. And so if you fall into that state, I find it tends to be obvious sooner because you're using phrases, you're repeating phrases that mean something. And I find that the phrases tend to get garbled if you fall into that state. And then you just know. you know. So maybe you open your eyes. or There are different ways of picking up the energy. So for example, in Burma, sometimes where I, I did my first really intensive loving kindness practice, I'd find myself repeating, may you be filled with suffering. May, and I'd go, no. <laughs> may you be free of suffering. Or, uh, my favorite example of that is um, I have a friend who's Swiss, so English is his fourth language, literally. And he came to the retreat center in Barry once to do a long retreat, and he was doing loving kindness. And his phrases were something like, may I be healthy and well, may I live with ease. And one day he heard himself repeating, may I be wealthy in hell. <laughs> and may I live with eels. <laughs> but because English is his fourth language, he just kept repeating it. And then he thought, that sounds weird. <laughs> and he kind of flipped all the way back to Swiss German. It was like, oh, you know, I need some energy. So it's just knowing that, you know, some balance in that way would probably be good. Yeah. Do you have anybody? Um, yeah, there is one from, from online. World. This is from Carol, and she says, I'm not understanding how to cultivation of compassion will over time lessen my attachment to a thing. What's the relationship, or is there any? Um, I think there is a relationship in the sense that... Uh, with something like mindfulness, as we pay attention to how all these things feel, um, we understand the difference between enjoying something fully and being attached to it. And that once we're attached to it, there's something else going on, right? We're scared, it's going to change. We're trying to uh, grasp. Um, I tell the story sometimes about up in Barry, uh, where the Insight Meditation Society is, there's a beautiful like three mile walk, like a loop walk a lot of people do after lunch. And there was one autumn which was like a spectacularly beautiful fall. And the leaves were just gorgeous. And I had a friend in California who'd never been to the East Coast at all. So from my point of view, she'd never really seen an autumn. And one day she said to me, I'm going to come. I'm going to come in like 10 days or something like that. So every day when I walked that loop, I'd look at those beautiful, gorgeous leaves on the trees, and I'd think, you better stay there. <laughs> I mean, she's never seen an autumn. If she comes, you know, and all the leaves are like, shriveled on the ground. It's going to be like nothing. You better stay on those trees. <laughs> and the next day I'd walk, and I'd have the same thought, and then I'd have the same thought. And then one day she called me and she said, I can't make it after all. So my first thought was, oh, now I can let the leaves fall from the trees, right? There's a big difference between enjoying something and having that extra thing. And it's only through mindfulness that we realize, you know what, that doesn't serve me. That's not making me happier. That's so draining, feeling I need to be in control of what I could never control, keep change from happening. Um, 
And when we experience compassion, because compassion is this mysterious force, you know, like the word is used differently. We think it might mean just feeling bad. So he needs to cultivate that. Um, it might, we might think it means feeling overcome, you know, brokenhearted all the time in a kind of bad way. Um, but when we really look at the sense of compassion, there is so much uh, real joy. I mean, that's one of the funny things about neuroscience when they're testing the brains of people doing compassion meditation is that the pleasure centers actually light up. And at first they thought, that is really strange. You know, uh, but it's not ordinary pleasure, you know, internally. But or I, I tell the story about the year the Dalai Lama came here to New York and he was teaching in Central Park. I think it was the first time he gave like a big public talk in Central Park. I see some of you nodding, so maybe you were there. Um, and there was just this huge number of people in, in the park. You know, the unofficial estimates were like 250,000 people. And it just like everywhere your eye could land, there were people. And when he started speaking, he started off in a way that startled me, where he said, you know, from a certain point of view, I haven't had an easy life. I had to assume temporal power at the age of 16. I had to flee into exile in my early 20s. I've had to try daily to keep an exile community intact. I've had to hear about all of the terrible suffering going on inside Tibet. And he said, I haven't had an easy life. And then he said, but I'm pretty happy, <laughs> you know, which is, of course, what one sees in him. And he went on to say, and it's obviously not ordinary happiness in the sense of avoiding pain and disregarding suffering. He said, the reason I'm pretty happy, even though it hasn't been such an easy life, is because of the force of compassion. Compassion makes me feel that one with everyone. And later on, he, he said, um, he was, there was a quote uh, from a Chinese poem, under the cherry blossom shade, there's no such thing as a stranger. You think about that. Like, how do we usually meet somebody new? Often, we hardly even notice them. It's all about me, right? What do they think of me? Do they like me? Do they like me more than they've ever liked anyone before? No, I said something stupid. They hate me. You know, it's such a lonely sort of silo where Think about it. He said, I've never met anyone I consider a stranger. Think about what that's like. Again, it doesn't mean you invite everyone home with you, but there is that meeting, that genuine acknowledgement. It's a very different way to live, and it's what makes him happy. So it was really astonishing for me, sitting in that huge, huge crowd, because I thought, I bet there are an awful lot of us who might be able to say, I haven't had such an easy life. And not so very many of us would follow it with, but I'm pretty happy, right? So we take a look. The more we develop compassion um, and we use mindfulness to see what's that really feel like? Is it really like a stupid state, you know? And is it really weak or what is it? Then we see, wow, this makes me a lot happier than a lot of things I devote my time to. You know, maybe I could change my priorities a little bit or whatever, but it's out of real love for ourselves, you know, not out of a kind of should list, things like that. So we're going to sit. I don't know if you want to stretch for a moment. Next week. Oh, the Friday, Saturday, yeah. Do sure. Yeah. Do you want to do that? Why don't you do that and then we'll. Oh, now? Yeah, before we start sitting, because.
You're right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name's Rebecca, and I work at Tibet House. And I just wanted to let you know that Sharon will be doing a two-day on February 5th and 5th and 6th. So that is a week end, and it's going to be on equanimity. Yeah, it's Friday night and Saturday. Friday night and all day And Saturday. you can come to one or two. Yeah, either you can buy a two-day pass or just come to one uh, a la carte. But you're welcome to purchase that through the website if you'd like. Um, also, we do have a Tuesday, Thursday meditation from 1 to 1.45 at lunchtime. That's donation-based, if anyone wants to come by, if you're in the area. And what else? We have membership, if anyone's interested in becoming a Tibet House member. You can see Tashi or me at the front. And also, anyone attending tonight, if they'd like to receive the link to this streaming file, just make sure that you leave your email with me. I'll be back here with an iPad. So if you'd like to watch it again, just I'll take your email. I think, is there anything? She also has a challenge going on, too. That's an amazing 6,000 people. It's February 1st to the 28th, 28 days of meditation online. Check out, yes, SharonSalsberg.com, and you could find that. Yes, yeah, so the challenge... The challenge is... Uh, Something we've done every, have any of you done it before? Uh, every, my, I had a book that came out some years ago called Real Happiness. Um, Real Happiness, The Power of Meditation, a 28-day program. And it came out in January, I think five or six years ago. And fortunately, February had 28 days. So we ran this, what we called a challenge on my website, where people had... Um, the chance to kind of do meditation and um, blog about it or comment on it. So we really formed, I think, a very supportive community of people. And we've done it every year since. And this year, um, there's a site called Happify.com, which uh, has a series of my guided meditations. And they've offered them. Uh, for that challenge, and so there are like 28 guided meditations uh, as well that you could listen to. And um, Happify, by the way, has some really fun animations uh, with different Dharma stories. It's got two by me, uh, and one I'm a dog. That's a really cute one. Uh, another one, I'm not sure what I am. I think I seem to be everybody. Well, it's only my voice, so I'm always everybody, but it's different creatures. Um, telling this story. Uh, so there are like an enormous number of people already signed up to do this challenge. And so uh, feel free if, if you'd like to join. And I am teaching here in this very room Friday night, the 5th of February, and all day Saturday, the 6th. Um, <coughs> the topic is equanimity, which in this context means balance. It's a, it's not indifference or apathy. It's the balance that's born of wisdom and how that interacts with states like compassion uh, and so on. So um, that, that was those announcements. There is a Tibet House concert, which is fabulous, which I will be out of town for, uh, uh, unfortunately. But um, you should check Tibet House's site because it's really great. Okay, so loving kindness meditation is its own methodology, which I'll guide you through. Rather than resting our attention on the feeling of the breath, we rest our attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases. And the phrases are the way we pay attention differently. It's wishing ourselves well, wishing well for others. This practice is thought of as a practice of generosity. It's gift giving. Even though the phrases are usually, the grammatical construct is like, may I, may you. It's not like pleading or begging. It's like my friend Sylvia Borstein said, she told me it's the hortatory subjunctive part of speech. She says, it's like, <laughs> you hand someone a birthday card and you say, may you have a happy birthday. May you have a great new year. May you be safe. May I be safe. You know, so it's got some juice to it. We gather our attention behind one phrase at a time, 
You don't have to try to churn up a special feeling or emotion. The power of the practice actually comes from that complete wholehearted gathering. Your mind will likely wander a billion times. We know that. It's the same skill set. See if you can gently let go and come back. Does it work as a mantra works? It's kind of like a mantra. It's kind of like a mantra, except that we know what the phrases mean. And there's also um, sometimes this imagery that accompanies it. And there's a certain, uh, depending on how we are with it, it might be we even use active imagination. Not always, you know, but the um, foundation is that gathering behind the repetition. Uh, but if you find yourself repeating, may you be filled with suffering, that's a clue, you know, that you're kind of off. Um, in some way. So the basic bookends, there is an arc, there's a sequence to the practice, but that's over the long term. In any one session, generally speaking, we start with the offering of loving kindness to ourselves, and we end with the offering of loving kindness to all beings everywhere. And what we do in the middle could be different all the time. Now maybe you have a friend who's celebrating something. So you start with yourself, you offer loving kindness to that friend, and you end with all beings, if that's the only time you have. Maybe you have a friend who's in trouble, so you include them. Or um, there is this category called a neutral person. It's someone you don't strongly like or dislike. That's like the shopkeeper. You don't really have a story for but maybe you're going to that very shop that afternoon, and you're sure to include them. Um, and then ending with all beings. So you don't have to be in a rush to fit in like everybody you know in any one session, but those are the basic bookends. So I'll just guide you through one of many, many possibilities, OK? So again, if you could sit comfortably, close your eyes or not. Let your energy just settle into your body. Over time, it's good to think about what phrases really work for you in the interests of time. I'll just suggest the kind of common phrases for this sitting, unless you have phrases of your own. And those often are, beginning with yourself, may I be safe. Be happy, be healthy, live with ease. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. So you can just repeat these phrases at whatever you know, rhythm or pace seems right gathering all of your attention behind one phrase at a time.
See if you can think of someone who's been like a benefactor for you. Maybe they've helped you directly. They've helped pick you up when you've fallen down. Maybe you've never met them, but they've inspired you from afar. The texts say this is the one whom when you think of them, you smile. It's like an embodiment of the force of love for you. It could be an adult, could be a child, could be a pet. Who makes you smile? So if someone like that comes to mind, you can bring them here. See if you can get an image of them or say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. Even if the words aren't perfect, it's okay because they're carrying the heart's energy. Someone here you didn't know before you got here. Maybe the person sitting next to you or just someone you noticed on your way in. You may not know their name even, but here's somebody who inevitably wants to be happy just as you do, who is vulnerable to change and loss just as you are, as we all are. So see what happens is you offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. And then everybody here, which includes perhaps those whom you know quite well, those whom you don't know at all, and yourself. May we be safe, be happy, be healthy, 
live with ease. And then all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown, may all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. So thank you all. Well, may you be happy and well and free from drowsiness and easily contented and satisfied and all those things. So take care. To learn about the Tibet House member archives, and upcoming Tibet House member trips with geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us. Tashi Dilek, and thanks for watching.